All right, my name is David Nolan. Um, sorry I'm a bit late. I got confused on the way over here. Um, my talk, uh, I don't even think it said the title of my talk, really, in the schedule. But anyways, I decided at the last second to call it Closure, Closure Script or How to Run Lisp Everywhere. Um, I've been giving versions of this talk for like three and a half years. I think almost as long as Closure Script has existed. Uh, it's actually fun to keep giving this talk because every time I get to give it, there's something new to talk about. Um, Lots of things are happening. And so uh, if you're familiar with Closure Script, there's some new stuff to hear and see. If you're not, there's definitely a lot of stuff uh, to hear and see. So just a little bit about myself. My name is David Nolan. Um, I now work at a company called Cognitect. Uh, we build, um, well, we do a lot of consulting, actually, uh, using Closure, which is a functional programming language that runs in the JVM. Um, as well as Closure Script, which is, I'm the lead developer on that, and that's a dialect of Closure that compiles the JavaScript, which I'll be talking about today. Uh, but we also uh, maintain a immutable relational database called Datomic, uh, which is very cool. If, if you're on the JVM, I recommend checking it out. Um, uh, imagine if you could run relational queries, but your database model was more like Git. Um, so yeah, that's Datomic. Uh, so again, we also steward Clojure, the programming language. Um, it's cool stuff. Uh, so I take it a lot of you have been programming for some time. And you know, it, you know I've been doing front-end stuff for about 10 years. Uh, prior to Cognitech, I was at the New York Times for four years. Before that, I worked on the Modern Museum of the Arts uh, refresh, worked on the New Museum, worked for Princeton University, worked from, for some startups. But I've been doing this a long time. Um, it was interesting because back when I started in 2000, 2000, 2004, 2005, and even today you still encounter this, you know, you had this, um, this, this promise that Java would be the thing that we ran both on the back end and on the front end. Um, as, you know, history often shows things don't work out the way um, people expect, um, JavaScript is what happened. Um, it turns out that JavaScript was um, better for various reasons. Um, on some, you know, on some axes, uh, worse than Java on many others. But you, really, you, you can't really be blaming um, anybody for that because the creator had to design it in 10 days and give it a name which, had, uh, which was a bit strange because JavaScript obviously had nothing to do with Java uh, beyond some cursory uh, C-based syntax. Um, so, so it's been, you know, 20, wow, 20 years. 20 years of JavaScript, since, I, cause I, since JavaScript first came out in 1995. Um, it was languishing for a long time. I, effectively, for a decade, nothing would really much was going on. Um, Google helped change that with the arrival of Google Maps. And then there was you know, a lot of marketing hype around this thing called Ajax, which is now kind of a bad word. Nobody talks about that anymore. But <clears throat> things are looking up for JavaScript. Um, there's finally some interest in modernizing the language. Uh, for those of you that follow, you, I mean, you've already seen this in, in the more recent browsers, support for ECMAScript 5, which adds some small enhancements. And there's some more radical stuff coming. Uh, they were referring to it as ECMAScript 6. Um, but it's now, I think, ES 2015. That's what they're calling it now. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, people are beginning to adopt something that doesn't actually run natively on browsers. Uh, so uh, how, many, how many of you ever used CoffeeScript? Raise your hand. Okay, good, a good, a good amount. So CoffeeScript was kind of funny because it was early on the transpiling uh, wave. People made fun of it uh, because people were like, why do you need to compile something to JavaScript? Uh, but now that ES6 is a thing and people want to get ready for it, everybody is compiling JavaScript to JavaScript. Compiling JavaScript is actually uh, quite a popular solution these days. Very few people are making fun of it. Uh, a lot of this is because there is increasingly better support from browsers themselves. Um, this takes the form of something called source mapping, uh, where you can map um, generated source locations back to the original ones, and debugging is relatively pleasant. Even if your um, original language uh, has significantly different semantics than JavaScript, like ClojureScript does. So CoffeeScript was a leader uh, when, in, you know, in transpiling to um, JavaScript. Uh, you also have a very popular uh, um, superset of JavaScript called TypeScript. Uh, people are really excited about this because a uh, great integration with Microsoft's uh, C Sharp development tools. Um, you, get, you get types, you can annotate them, um, which gives you a really great IDE support as well as basic sanity checking. 
Uh, you have things like ASM.js, which was an initiative by Mozilla, which takes, um, you can take a C++ code base and use LLVM and generate this extremely low level um, JavaScript where basically you allocate a heap as one gigantic um, binary JavaScript array and then your C++ program uh, operates on this, um, on this heap, so to speak. But it, it works. Uh, Unreal, you know, there's all these demos that Mozilla likes to show off of Unreal <clears throat> running under Firefox. You have things like Dart. Uh, Dart uh, was sort of controversial when it came out. I think people don't really care that much anymore. I mean, the people that like it use it. Uh, it is, uh, you know, if you like Java, it's not really, I think, you know, in some, many, some ways better than Java. Um, it's, a, it's a fine language, but it also had to compile to JavaScript, right? It's kind of a non-starter to in introduce a new virtual machine um, and target the web and not compile to JavaScript. So Dart has to do that as well. And then again, this is the big thing, right? JavaScript is being compiled to JavaScript uh, quite a bit. Um, a lot of frameworks are switching to this. If you, if you do Angular, uh, Angular threw in their towel with TypeScript. Um, even things like React, React has um, their JSX thing, so they have to use a preprocessing compilation pass. Uh, Ember uh, is now moving all their code base to ES, uh, ES 2015, and so on. So, so compiling to JavaScript is just going to be normal. Um, you should get ready for it. So ClojureScript is sort of validated. Uh, three and a half, four, 45 months ago, three and a half, three, more than almost four years ago, when we uh, announced ClojureScript, which was a dialect of closure to JavaScript, people were like, this just sounds crazy. Um, uh, because again, compiling JavaScript wasn't um, taken that seriously. But all, what I want to point out today is that ClojureScript is actually not like any of these languages. Uh, these languages are, are fine languages, but they really maintain the status quo. Uh, if you're familiar with C or Java or, or C++ or whatever, um, these aren't uh, really bringing anything new to the table. Uh, ClojureScript has gone in a different direction, and its approach is quite radical um, as with respect to modern engineering practice. And we'll see that this sort of radicalism brings benefits that may not be obvious. Uh, if I was going to sum up what's cool about ClojureScript, it takes two things very seriously, uh, which isn't the case for a lot of things we saw on the previous slide. Uh, data structures are huge. Um, and interactivity is a very big thing. And we'll see this to good effect. Um, so uh, I highly recommend, if you're, if you're not familiar with the history of Lisp, I, I only have time to talk about a few things. I really recommend reading this book called The Dream Machine. Um, it's about this man, J.C.R. Licklider, who led DARPA. Uh, he funded people like Douglas, Douglas Engelbart, who sort of invented everything, uh, video conferencing, word processing, uh, the mouse, um, so on. The mother of all demos, that was Douglas Engelbart. Uh, JC, he was kind of a you know, interesting, very brilliant, but also, you know, strange person. And Licklider gave him the, you know, government funds to try these crazy ideas, which really shaped, you know, the next 50 years of computing. Um, he also happened to funnel money towards um, some other interesting people. Uh, this gentleman, uh, second from the left, is John McCarthy, who invented Lisp. And by inventing Lisp, he invented functional programming, interpreters, garbage collection, um, lots of things, all at the same time. Uh, to his right is somebody who's less well-known. That's Ed Fredkin. He invented something called the tree. Uh, sometimes people will write this as T-R-I-E, uh, but uh, he uh, named the data structure off of um, retrieval. So T-R-I-E from retrieval. And we're going to talk about his data structures today because they're still relevant um, and there are properties that, um, that I think uh, that are still aren't taken advantage of as well as they should be. And ClojureScript really takes trees to the next level, uh, thanks to um, prior art and closure, as well as some early papers um, from people who worked on Scala. So yeah, Lisp is awesome. Uh, the beauty of Lisp and the reason that I still appreciate it uh, is that it's, it's, it's a lot of power um, uh, without ha introducing too much complexity. Uh, this is a slide from the Lisp 1.5 user's manual. That's what this is. Uh, and then uh, this, the reason I point out this slide is this is the thing that Alan Kay, who invented object-oriented programming through Smalltalk, he said when he understood this page, he uh, felt like he discovered the Maxwell's equations of software. This is the one single page that defines eval and apply. That's all you need to bootstrap Lisp. This is the entire thing. Uh, if you've ever taken the time to go through the Structure Interpretation of Computer Programs, which is a fantastic book, uh, when you understand eval and apply, it's um, truly an amazing experience. Okay, so we still believe in the McCarthy dream. So 
This is why we uh, do ClojureScript. So let's talk a bit about ClojureScript. Um, it is now 45 months old. It's not a young thing. It's not a young project. Even though some of you may not, not have heard of it, uh, we've been working on it for a very long time now. Um, it has greater than 4,000 GitHub stars, which means that um, it's relatively popular open source uh, project. It has 104 contribution, like contributors. People have submitted patches to Jira. So there's a large uh, contribution base. Uh, usually, if there, you have a lot of contributors, you have a lot of users. Um, it's used in production at quite a few companies, some of them which you may have heard of, Consumer Reports, eBay, Prismatic, Reuters. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not a toy piece of technology. Um, it also now targets many things. This is all new stuff. Uh, this wasn't true before. Um, it runs today on Rhino, on the JVM. It runs today on Nashorn, which is uh, Java 8's new high-performance JavaScript engine. Uh, it runs on browsers going back to Internet Explorer 6. Um, we take backwards compatibility extremely seriously, far more seriously than most JavaScript-based projects. Uh, and it runs today on Node.js as well. And it also, we're working on, but it actually, it does work. People have already shipped um, uh, apps via the JavaScript core engine, which allows you to bind directly into Directive-C. People are shipping uh, ClojureScript-based iOS apps. Um, really cool stuff. Okay, so it's, it's a neat piece of technology. People are, are productive with it. Um, but let's talk about um, the two things I want to focus on, data structures and interactivity, so that you can understand what is ClojureScript bringing to the table that you're not going to get from ES 2015 or Dart or TypeScript or whatever. Uh, in order to understand that, we have to understand, have a basic understanding of the data structures that ClojureScript implements. Um, again, they're trees. This is a slide from an EP EPFL paper, which is a modification of something that Rich Hickey, the inventor of Clojure, um, sort of uh, popularized um, and in the Clojure programming language. The next set of slides are not my slides, um, mostly because the next set of slides are really great. They were by this uh, gentleman, Zach Allen. He works at um, Hacker School, which some, some of you may have heard of. It's a really cool, like, kind of like um, writer's retreat for programmers uh, in New York City. Uh, but he, he put some great slides together. I'm just going to reuse them. Okay. So even if you don't do functional programming and you like Java or C Sharp or C++ or whatever, uh, I think it's still important to understand what is the um, big idea behind the sort of functional programming mindset and what are the algorithmic ideas uh, behind persistent data structures, which I'm going to talk about. So even if you don't want to do functional programming, the ideas are still relevant for whatever paradigm you actually want to use. It doesn't matter. Um, so functional programmers have this mindset where they want to talk about immutable values, um, not mutable objects. Most object-oriented programs um, emphasize mutable objects. Uh, in the functional mindset, this is a bad thing. You would rather program with values. Um, you know, uh, immutable values have really great properties, things like numbers. You have the number one. There's no such thing as mutating the number one, right? The number one is a value. Uh, so functional programmers want their collection types to have the same properties that they expect from things like numbers. Um, because you get the same reasoning properties that you get um, uh, from doing, you know, simple operations like adding two things and knowing that the original things don't change, you get a new thing. Okay, and so there's this word that gets thrown around in the functional programming community. There's a lot of jargon in the functional programming community, and we're going to try to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, you hear this word persistent, but this isn't persistent in the way that you often hear uh, in normal, you know, computer speak. When people say persistent, they mean disk. Uh, in the functional programming community, when you say persistent data structure, all they're saying is it's a immutable data structure where you don't destroy previous copies. So if you have a mutable array, it represents some logical value, right? The, the, the mutable array represents some logical value. If you mutate it, whatever logical value represented before is destroyed. It represents some new logical value. You can't recover the previous one unless you decide to maintain in some other place some set of deltas. Uh, so uh, persistent data structures are not like this. Again, you, if you update some persistent data structure, you're going to get a new thing. Uh, you're probably thinking, well, how does that work? Uh, you're probably aware of things like copy on write. And that's fine when your data set is small or your data or your whatever, um, but it doesn't really work as, your, as the amount of data you have increases. Uh, the other thing that's really neat is that they're fast. This is relatively new. This is um, within the past 10 years that people have figured out how to make this stuff not be dog slow. Uh, to understand how they work, you have to at least know one of the simplest data structures you ever learn, which is a linked 
list. And this might be like, come on, really? Uh, they're based off linked lists? Conceptually, they are based off linked lists, and we'll see how. So what's neat about a linked list is that you have um, some set of pointers pointing to different nodes of your linked list. And then what's really great about a linked list is you can just cons um, a new head onto the list, right? You can just, it's like a stack. You just cons a new head on. But what's beautiful about this is it's not like a mutable array, right? When you cons the head onto the list, you don't destroy the previous list, right? It's a new list, and the old list is still preserved. Uh, you can add another head onto this list, and you've got a list, the original list, you've got the list where you cons one element on, and you've got the list um, that you cons the next element on. You can even uh, uh, get the tails, and you can get the tail twice, and add a different head. And so now you have three uh, values, three distinct values, and obviously on this slide they're sharing um, uh, more than 50% of their data, right? More than 50% of their data is shared. The memory, they share memory. This is a, this is a huge idea when you, when you look at um, uh, persistent data structures. It's called structural sharing, more jargon. This is what functional programmers like to talk about, structure sharing. Uh, also, if you're familiar with Git, this is how Git works. If you know that the, the way that the Git trees work, um, you point to different blobs, and a, a new when you make a change, you update um, the blob for the for the file. There are no deltas. Git does not record deltas, and you just point to a new tree. And the reason that Git is reasonably compact is because um, each tree shares structure with the previous tree. Uh, so this is not a new idea. This is an old trick, except we're doing it with data structures in memory. So space efficiency, this is going to get us space efficiency, it's going to get us computational efficiency, which is less obvious um, until we see some next slides. Um, but all this is old stuff. Phil Bagwell wrote about um, doing this with data structures in a paper called the Array Map Tree and the Hash Array Map Tree. These papers are from 2000 and 2001. Uh, he was at EPFL. These papers, however, emphasized mutable versions of these data structures. They were not immutable. They were not persistent. Uh, Rich Hickey created Clojure, uh, and then he took, he read this paper, and he realized with a very small modifications, you could get um, immutable data structures out of the mutable um, ones that Bagwell described. Uh, so he invented something called the bitmap vector tree. Uh, Clojure actually invented this. Um, it's since been adopted by uh, many languages, um, probably most popular, Scala, uh, and then, you know, you, you'll see pretty good ones in languages like Haskell. Uh, now. Um, the idea is data lives in the leaves. Uh, it's a prefix tree used for string lookup. We'll, we'll see what that means. Um, it's a bitwise tree. Okay, so uh, the, even though they're technically called um, um, bitmap vector trees, uh, in Clojure we say just persistent vector. Uh, and how do they work? Uh, it's, an, it's an array of arrays, and we're just going to pick right now, just for simplicity's sake, an arbitrary dimension. So it's a uniform array of arrays where all the arrays are the same dimension. We're going to pick four. Uh, so at the root, you have an array, and each um, element of the array um, are more arrays. Uh, and each element of those arrays are more arrays, and eventually you're going to bottom out to the leaves where the values live. And so here is you know, some numbers. This is a persistent vector. Uh, that has a bunch of numbers in it. Persistent vectors have the same property that you've come to expect from arrays, mutable ones. They have random access. Uh, you can efficiently add to the end. Um, you can iterate them through them uh, with relative ease and efficiency. So you're probably asking, well, if you structure your data this way, how are you going to get anything? So let's look at what that looks like. OK, so it turns out that um, indexes are pretty nice uh, um, when you look at an element, looking for an element in an array, because that number represents um, a binary number. This is the prefix lookup. So what you can do is you can mask bits of the index to find out where the, um, the leaf value is. Uh, if, we, if our dimension is 4, we can mask off the first two bits. This tells us to look at index 1, um, counting from 0. Um, the next two bits will tell us to look at index 2, counting from 0. The next two bits, 2, counting from 0. Uh, we're out of bits. Uh, the value is at index uh, 2. And so we know to return the value um, 106. So on modern hardware and on modern uh, language runtimes, uh, the most you're going to have to do is dereference some arrays and do some bit masking. This is the type of thing that the JVM, uh, as well as modern JavaScript engines, uh, optimize uh, like crazy. 
Uh, so what about updating? So this is where we see structural sharing and how we can avoid the problems with naive copy on write. Uh, if, if we want to get an updated value of this, um, all we have to do is replace, uh, using the same trick, we know which arrays we need to change uh, because of the index. We just need to replace all the arrays on the path to the value we need to change. We want to replace 106 with foo, and that's it. None of the array, other arrays that weren't on that path need to change. So this could be a very large data structure, and at most, we have to update uh, four arrays. Everything else is going to be shared. So length four internal vectors, no, that's not a good idea. Um, after much uh, empirical testing uh, at EPFL and, and as well as in the design of closure, uh, 32 on modern hardware tends to be really good uh, because of cache lines. Uh, it gives you a very good update uh, versus um, lookup time performance. So uh, closure uses this. It's a wide branching factor. Uh, to understand how good that branching factor is, um, we just need to do a little bit of um, math. Uh, if you're uh, vector was seven levels deep, seven levels deep. That's 34 billion elements. Even if, if this was a flat array with 64-bit pointers, that's 256 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, so you don't need to go very, um, the depth doesn't need to be very, uh, not much depth uh, to get to store massive amounts of data. Uh, at most, you need to update seven arrays to update this massive data structure that would take um, hundreds of gigs of RAM uh, to store. So that's pretty good. Uh, I don't actually, I'm going to skip this next slide because I don't have a demo for this thing yet. Okay, so, you're, so now that we, we know something about this data structure, we're like, well, what can you do with it, right? So what's the value proposition for, for this? Uh, I mean, so there's actually, in the closure world, uh, we, it's great because what, what you get to do from this is you get to do um, basically lock-free concurrent programming. Um, Closure's been out there for seven years, uh, and people aren't complaining about lock-based programming. People aren't, comp aren't, aren't complaining about shared memory concurrency, right? Nobody in the closure world is saying shared memory concurrency is hard because we don't need locks on these data structures, right? If they're just designed to work with threads. You can share them. It doesn't matter. All the problems that you have uh, with mutable objects and concurrent software, they disappear uh, because we're, we, we use values uh, and they're thread safe. Um, but that's great for doing back-end server stuff, um, and people are doing building great systems with, with Clojure for that. But what does it really buy you on the front end? And this was actually less obvious. This changed about a year ago uh, with, um, uh, really two years ago, but we didn't understand until six years after they announced it. Uh, Facebook announced something called React. Uh, React was a very sort of radical move uh, for uh, client-side UI development. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with React. A few of you, okay. So even if you like Angular or Ember or, or what have you, it doesn't matter. The React has um, a very interesting conceptual design which matters if your data is immutable. And React is a diffing-based system. It's an incremental diff. Um, the way that it works is it treats the DOM um, as a GPU. Uh, so what you do is you say, I've got some data, compute a virtual DOM, right, that represents what my data looks like. And then if I change the data, right, if I supply new data, it computes a different virtual DOM, and then they diff, they diff these. It, it sounds slow, but the thing is, again, you, you, you apply some algorithms and you can make it fast. So they take advantage of memoization, um, they take advantage of, of lazy diffing, there's all these tricks they, they do to make this fast. Uh, and, and, the, and the truth is, is the DOM is so slow. It's so slow now, and JavaScript engines are so fast. Um, that even though, even though this might seem computationally ex expensive, it's still faster than touching the DOM or reading from the DOM. It's faster to just do this, uh, this tree diffing in memory than it is to um, interact with the DOM at all. Uh, again, just to reiterate, it gives you, or the React gives you a beautiful model. It's simple. It's like the server request REST model, right? I supply some data and I have some stateless view. That's how React works. You supply data, you get some stateless view. If I change the data, it computes a new stateless view. And the way that it works is the algorithm takes those two views and it calculates the minimal set of changes that it actually needs to apply the DOM, to the DOM, right? It runs through both trees, says, this is what changed, let's make a, a set of changes we need to apply um, and batch them all at once. Uh, and this is great for perf. You, all your changes happen at one time um, the worst thing you can do, and you see this all the time when people use jQuery, they're inside of a for loop, they're reading from the DOM, and they're updating the DOM, 
right? That is a performance disaster. People do this all the time. It's horrible. People are like, why is it eight frames per second to scroll on this page? Because somebody wrote a for loop where they're doing these updates um, and reads interleaved. Uh, and, and the big value proposition of React is do not interleave. Uh, we're going to batch these changes for you so it happens all at once. OK, so given what I told you about immutable data, um, this slide is actually pretty interesting. Uh, if, you, if you supply React with immutable data, what can it do, do for free? It can actually compute the reverse set of changes. I can flip V1 um, and V0, and React will compute um, the reverse set. And this was something that I thought was mm, theoretically possible. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And I put together some demos that, are, that were simple. And then somebody did one that's far, far, far more impressive um, that shows this in action. So uh, this man, uh, Jack Shadler, he works for Ableton Live. He's a UI dev. He read my post. He said, well, OK, that sounds good for trivial things, but let me do something less trivial. I'm going to build a 64 by 64 pixel editor. I'm going to represent the, the, the canvas space with an immutable vector something that contains 4,096 elements, but it's an immutable value. I, I want to see how simple it is for me to implement undo, redo, um, generating animations, all this stuff. Stuff that's really hard, that's really annoying to do um, with mutable data structures. So I'll show this demo now. Um, so here we go. This is, um, well, let me just refresh. Just, OK, there we go. So this is his, um, can we, no. This is. That's not so nice. Let me, let me turn off mirroring. Sorry. Apologies. Um, OK. Sorry about that. OK. So here we go. Um, it's a little pixel editor. Again, this is, this is OK. Um, and then I can draw here. Let me pick a different color. Right. And you should see on the, on the right side, you've got, um, you've got the history uh, accumulating and so on. Uh, I can pick a different color, go like this. And again, this is changing an immutable, this is an immutable vector, right? Each one of these updates is um, creating a new immutable vector. Uh, I can click. Undo, I can click um, redo, and I can scrub through, I can scrub through the history, and you see on the left there's a preview and it's fast. Right? This is all using immutable data. Um, so how much code did this take uh, for him to do? Uh, how, the, the undo logic, like how, how much work was it? Um, whoops. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so his entire, all the logic, all the logic, everything you saw, undo, redo, as well as the playback, the scrubbing, um, you can see right here it's 67 lines of code. Um, his thing is simply a stack. He's got this stack, and he's just pushing each immutable vector onto that stack. Um, these are, each, each function is three lines of code. That's it. That's all, all the undo logic. This is, and his program is not simple. His program is 2,000 lines of closure script. It's a very complicated uh, UI program, but this part of his application took, you know, maybe it took him 30 minutes, um, uh, which is pretty cool. And this, is, this, fell out, so this fell completely out of the fact that he had uh, immutable uh, data for his data representation. So definitely a win for um, closure, script, uh, closure script semantics uh, giving you a lot. Uh, with you having to do very little. Okay. And uh, then you're, so those of you that are familiar with data structure are probably asking, well, how memory efficient is it? Well, we, we sort of intuitively understood from the earlier slides that it must be, you know, somewhat memory efficient. But here I did a heap snapshot. Chrome DevTools has really great, grab, um, really great uh, tools for memory profiling. Um, the application starts at 3.8 megabytes. This is actually his app. What I did was I wrote a version of his app. I tweaked it so that um, you, if you record uh, 1,000 snapshots, like where you just edit one pixel, right, 1,000 snapshots versus uh, taking an array and cloning it 1,000 times. Uh, on the left, you can see to do 1,000 snapshots, um, 1,000 levels of undo. 
is 0.2 megabytes if you use persistent data structures. Um, on the right, that's using a mutable array and copying it. Uh, that's 1.7 megabytes. So nearly an order of magnitude less memory is used if you use um, immutable data structures. So you're not just saving um, computational you know, time, you're also saving uh, space. Okay, uh, and, this, and you might be thinking, this sounds crazy if you haven't heard this before, but it's not crazy. Actually, Facebook has dub started doubling down on immutable data. Um, Facebook, they're behind React. React is exploding. Uh, for good reason, it's, it's solid technology. Uh, and then, you know, I showed that uh, React is twice as fast as it is out of the box. If you supply immutable data instead of mutable JavaScript objects, um, React gets a massive performance boost. Uh, and so they started um, implementing their own idiomatic um, uh, persistent data structure library that's based off all the stuff that I already talked about. Uh, they, they're taking the, the prior art that we already implemented in Clojure and Clojure Script, and they're building their own version of it. And that's really cool. Uh, and React is um, slowly adding more integration hooks, so it's nice to use. Okay, and then again, so there, there are, again, there are some cool companies. Meteor.js actually uses uh, our persistent data structures for dependency calculation. Uh, Prismatic, which you may have heard of, uses it. And the, a really interesting company called Circle CI uses um, uh, ClojureScript, but they're combining ClojureScript with React using a library that I wrote called Ohm. Um, there's a really awesome demo here. Uh, which I want to show, which shows also what you can get in a, in a less fun application. So CircleCI is a continuous integration product that has customers and so on. It's like whatever, Travis, it's a, it's a commercial uh, CI server service. Um, so they recently came out with this post where they use Ohm. Um, and sadly, I can't, I can't play you the audio here, but I can explain it to you while, it, while, it, while it's playing. So Ohm has this really nice feature in which we see we actually um, create, um, we, we use persistent data structures for every single field of every object in your program. So not just things like just the canvas surface. Literally every domain model is backed by an immutable data structure, including what would traditionally be these are objects with fields. We actually use persistent data structures for this. And so what this demo shows is that um, they actually leverage this to do something that's really hard to do without a lot of, 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 of pre-planning uh, in the software development cycle. Oops, it's in one second. Let me bump this up. Is that possible? Yes. Okay. So what they're going to show is they're going to type in this form field. And this is all transient stuff. They're going to type in a form field. They're going to filter it down. Uh, and let's see this. So this is, this is transient UI state. When, when users are typing in fields, this is not something you normally save. There's, not, there's nothing to snapshot right there, not in an easy way, uh, not without crawling your entire object graph. But if you store everything as an immutable data structure from the, from the outset, you just say, that's the strategy we're going to use, you can do some really cool things. So what they do is you can type, and you can be in a certain view, and you can press a keyboard command. And because the app state is the single source of truth, they can serialize it to a string. And so they've, they've, they've serialized it to a string and copied it to their pasteboard. They're in Firefox now, a different browser. They've pasted in that serialized string. And they're now exactly every single aspect of the application state. It doesn't matter what state they were in, which flags, which, which fields, it's all reconstructed. So now when they have a problem with a UI, with a UI bug, uh, where the designer says this doesn't work, you can say, run this keyboard command and just give me your serialized app state. I can, rec I can literally jump back to it. I don't have to go through some ridiculous series of steps that you have to email me. So pretty cool. Okay, uh, so interactivity, this is the last thing so uh, that I want to show. So we talked a lot about data structures and the benefits for application design. So what is it like to use ClojureScript? Uh, I just want to show a really quick demo. Uh, ClojureScript, I think, is a lot of fun. So here is, hopefully I can show this. I wasn't expecting to have so little screen space. Um, but here, what is it like? Uh, so I want to demo something that we spent a lot of time on recently, which is, um, just making it work with, so it works with, it works with, you can actually hook, hook up ClojureScript, a REPL, 
to a browser, Firefox, Chrome, doesn't matter. Uh, you can launch Rhino with it, NASHORN. But here I want to show something really fun, which is uh, you can load it um, uh, directly into, you can start up a node REPL, uh, just to give you a sense of what the compilation model is like. So what's happened here is that even though ClojureScript is written in Clojure, we can boot a node subprocess. Uh, down here, I can uh, type some things. I'm going to have to put the mic down so I can type. OK, so um, I can go, you know, this works, right? So it really feels like you're using Clojure. It doesn't really feel like you're using JavaScript. In fact, unless you type a function or something like that, you wouldn't even know that you're typing Clojure. So there's a function that adds two things together, and you can see that we generate uh, JavaScript. But it's completely opaque for you, uh, opaque to you. Uh, lots of things work. If you like functional programming or if you're familiar with functional tools in Ruby or Python, um, there's a lot of neat things. Uh, so I can go, uh, right, I can take, you know, construct a range of 100 numbers, uh, increment them all by one. Um, this is all based on lazy sequences. So if you're a fan of functional programming, or right here, so this, this is pretty cool. So this, is, this would look like an error, right? So range, range here is, would, uh, creates an infinite set, uh, infinite list of integers starting at uh, one. So this should blow up my program, but it doesn't because we use lazy sequences, which are really great for uh, functional programming. So this, even though I've supplied an infinite set, I said I only want 10 of them. So this is sort of like on-demand lazy programming. So this is some aspects of Haskell of, available to you. Um, the other thing I didn't talk too much about is we deeply integrate with Google Closure Library. So Google Closure Library is not that well known, even though it's, it's basically 300,000 lines of battle-tested functionality that Google uses, all their apps use this. Google Spreadsheets, Google Mail, Google Docs, uh, they use Google Closure. It's one of the best, uh, highest quality libraries you could use. It's just typical in Google style, it's very badly documented. But once you, once you understand it, it has an impressive set of functionality. So I can go, um, so I can import anything from the Google Closure Library uh, into this node REPL. Um, so for example, it has lots of interesting helpers, like I want to know if, you know, in a cross-browser way, because that's really the problem with, with, with JavaScript programming, is just making things work across browsers. I want to know if this or JavaScript array contains the number three. And that works. Uh, so we have a unified way to import JavaScript libraries. It works for ClojureScript, it works for Google Clojure, and it even works for things like React. So in the JavaScript world, you're often like, am I going to use Browserify? Am I going to use uh, uh, Babel? Am I going to use Webpack? And it's like your team has to pick n different ways to load code. Uh, and this, you don't have to do this ClojureScript. If you're targeting iOS, Rhino, NASHORN, Node.js, or just the browser, um, it's Code is always loaded in the same way. There's not a different way to do it. So here I'm going to load, for example, some string utilities. And this is closure, This is a closure script require. I can go like this. And, you know, string joining is a thing, and it's available in the standard library. That's cool. Uh, over here, I'm going to show something that's also really nice, and this is definitely going back to the Lisp roots, and that it's really annoying if, you, if you're familiar with Lisp to have to um, stop coding. So often when you watch JavaScript devs, they, 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 they launch their app, there's a bug, they have to kill their app, and they have to restart it after they fix the thing, which really is, is, is annoying if you're you know, sort of in the, in the flow or in the zone. So here I can require this, this file. I'm going to alias it to a different name. Uh, hopefully this works. And so it required that file, and you notice what does the file do? It, it, it enables console printing, which is console logging in JavaScript. Uh, and then I see that it prints hello world, and I've got this. I can go hello uh, foo to invoke some function, right? And that's just going to add two numbers. But where this gets fun is that I don't, I don't have to kill, I don't have to kill the process. Um, I don't have to kill the process to change the code. Uh, on the bottom, I actually have, in the same way you would with CopyScript, it had, we have full incremental compilation, right? So. We actually take all your sources and we know exactly what's changed and we only recompile what's changed, which is great uh, for large code bases. So even if you have hundreds of thousands of closure script and you only change one file, we're only gonna change the files that actually are, are relevant in that dependency graph. Um, here I can actually, without quitting my REPL, for those of you that are familiar with Ruby, this is, this is like normal. Uh, Ruby has a really awesome thing 
or is there, yeah, Ruby supports um, reloading libraries. Uh, here I'm going to type um, reload, and I've changed, I've changed the um, operation here, and I should get six back, right? This should just work. Uh, and so that's another thing that people really fall in love with very quickly, is that the dev cycle uh, in ClojureScript is very, very fast. Uh, and everything that I'm demoing here in Node actually works if you connect a REPL directly to the browser. So that's really, really common um, to actually have the REPL running. You're building your, your client-side application, and you don't, have to re you don't have to refresh. You can just change the source file, reload it, and then see the updated application state without blowing everything away. Okay, uh, so there are some things I didn't have time for because you can only talk, you know, ClojureScript is a huge programming language with rid a ridiculous number of features, so you just can't talk about everything. But some things I sort of uh, glossed over is that ClojureScript, um, we still emphasize the most important target is the browser, so we leverage whole program optimization. This is directly from Google Clojure Compiler. So a lot of people use things in the JavaScript world, use things like uh, Uglify um, or UE Compressor, and none of them are as good as the Google Closure Compiler. The Google, the Google Closure Compiler does a, what's called dead code elimination. It actually walks your entire call graph, and anything in any library that isn't on that call graph will be stripped from the final production artifact. Um, so if you actually write console log um, uh, hello world in ClojureScript, even though the standard library is 10,000 lines of code, we'll only emit um, console log hello world. We also support code splitting, which is becoming more and more important these days. You hear about, a lot about this in the Webpack community. Uh, Google Closure already solved this. So you get dead code elimination and code splitting. Um, and all this REPL stuff I'm showing, it's actually completely extensible. The iOS integration is, is a third-party library. So they get to pick it. So all the lo code loading, all the analysis, uh, incremental compilation, um, it, somebody wrote an iOS REPL and it's oh, 200 lines of code. So you don't have to reinvent uh, the fundamental stuff. You just have to say, there's some differences for this JavaScript runtime. You only have to implement those differences, and we can target it. Uh, so hopefully, that's a lot of information. Um, uh, that's about all that I had. I, if you guys have questions, uh, you know, feel free to ask them. Thanks, that's it. <laughs> <clears throat> Questions? Yes. Are you going to talk about protocols and add Oh, so, okay. So I'm giving a talk um, tomorrow um, about Ohm more specifically. Uh, I'm not going to dig too much into protocols. It's mostly going to be about how does ClojureScript React integration look different from React itself. And that's almost all going to be about um, some of the things that I talked about, but more focused on exactly what Ohm uh, delivers. It also is going to be a little bit different because React is moving in a different direction these days, in a, in a good way, in a good way. Um, and some of the things they're working on are really big, like things like, uh, I don't know if you people have heard of Relay. They announced this at ReactConf earlier this year. And that stuff is really cool. I recommend checking that out if you haven't seen it, Relay, um, which is a great design, and we're probably just going to follow them. Um, but yeah, so if you're interested in this stuff and you want to hear more about specific things about application development. Uh, that'll be covered in my talk tomorrow. Other questions? Right. So, I mean, I work on the compiler. So, so the question was, what do I use for workflow? So I work on the compiler, and my, my main concern these days is just making sure that everybody's stuff works. And I don't, you know, my, my, my workflow is really primitive. Like actually here, uh, for me, this is a big deal. Um, now, um, it might not seem like a big deal to everyone else, but ClojureScript is now a Java jar. All you need is this jar. You can launch it in the way you would launch any Java program. And this is huge, right? This is the way Clojure works. And for me, I don't know about, you know, you can use whatever tools that you want, but if your thing isn't as simple as launching a jar, it's pretty obnoxious because that means it doesn't integrate well, well, integrate well with custom bash scripts and Maven and blah, 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 blah. So, so I actually prefer this because this is the absolute minimum thing you have to deliver. But there are things like IntelliJ um, has a great plugin called Cursive. 
uh, which um, has um, evolving closure script integration. It's about to get really good. I love, I don't, I don't know if you guys use IntelliJ, but I now, I'm a huge IntelliJ fan. Cursive is amazing um, and it's quite good. All the things you, get, you expect, refactoring, um, uh, type inference, uh, integrated REPL, all this stuff they're, they're, they're building in. And um, I'm looking forward to that because I think that's preferred to doing this stuff. Um, but the other, the other thing that's popular is Emacs. You know, a lot of people use Emacs. I actually don't tend to not use Emacs these days. Uh, my workflow is whatever my text editor is, I launch a thing, um, this, like this process, which kicks off a REPL, kicks off auto build, and I'm done. I can, I can focus on coding. So I, I like to keep it simple. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, thank you.